Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Ramshaw. I'm the co-founder and CEO of The 19th, and I'm thrilled to be at the Culturati Summit, in particular to get to uh, conduct this interview with Morgan Debon. Morgan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to read a quick uh, bio for Morgan so we make sure we're all on the same page with her incredible resume. Uh, Morgan is the founder and CEO of Blavity Inc., the leading media company for Black culture and millennials. Uh, since Blavity's launch in 2014, Morgan has led the company to successfully acquire Travel Noir, a travel platform for Black millennials, uh, and Shadow and Act, a Black entertainment news site. Uh, under Morgan's leadership, Blavity has launched several companies, uh, several leading consumer summits, including Summit 21 for Black women creators uh, and Bay Area's Afrotech, which is the largest tech conference for Black innovators and founders. Hopefully we will all be back together for all of these events really soon. Um, as of today, Blavity Inc. has raised $12 million from top Silicon Valley venture firms, which is amazing. Congratulations. Uh, Morgan's also a passionate small business advocate and advises early stage entrepreneurs on how to scale their business in her signature Work Smart Advising program. Finally, she is the founder of M Rose Essentials, a natural skincare and essentials line, and Growth Notebook, uh, which uh, produces productivity and mindset planners. So, very well rounded, incredible entrepreneur. Uh, welcome, Morgan. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You know, I can't just do one thing. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. And especially in this moment in history, trying to do all of these things is really incredible. So, um, well, Morgan, I want to start by asking you, so sort of so many countries right now, uh, so many companies right now uh, across the globe, across the country are talking about DEI, are talking about belonging um, as sort of the salve needed to improve their businesses, to better serve their audiences and markets, and, and maybe most important to enhance their corporate culture. And I just want to ask, you know, for you, this was all the basis on which you actually started a business, which was brilliant. Um, you were way ahead of the curve. So can you talk a little bit about your decision uh, to launch Blavity and the sort of need you saw in the market through that lens? Yeah, so I started the company. Um, I was a young CEO, so it's 24 when I started. I was working in tech. Um, a little bit about me, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, so, you know, Midwest through and through. And made this giant leap to go to Silicon Valley, which at the time was like not the trendy thing to do, you know, and especially not in Missouri. Um, <clears throat> and so I moved to the Bay Area and I loved the culture of innovation and creativity and um, the spirit of entrepreneurship that is just so omnipresent everywhere in the Bay. And I was still feeling like, wait, hold on, there's something missing. You all aren't creating products for me. You know, we, we black people are never the target audience. Uh, when you're learning about how products are built, what you realize in the Bay is that it's just a group of people, typically men sitting in a room and they're looking at data and they're coding and they're looking at how things are working, but they are looking at a data set that doesn't actually reflect an American culture or population. And so um, to me, that was just kind of like an, an aha moment where it inspired me to build a company where we are the first person, the first target user. When we're doing research studies, when we're looking at our data, we're looking at it from the Black millennial perspective as an audience and as a consumer and thinking about how can we super serve this demographic and go really deep and make sure that no matter where they're going, they can have the content, the experience, the network, to be able to live their best life and be happy and feel like they are understood by a brand and by a company and, or by just a piece of content that they're, they're looking at on social media. I mean, it seems so obvious in retrospect, like of course there was a huge audience and engaged audience. Did it feel obvious to you in the moment that there was this huge uh, you know, void that was missing in the market? I mean, when you were trying to make the case for Blavity, you know, in those sort of early days in Silicon Valley as you're working it into it and doing different things, did you in the back of your head uh, have this sort of nagging feeling like there's a huge market here, why hasn't anyone tapped it yet? Yeah, I definitely had some things that I had to work through. So um, you know, one, there, there are black media companies, legacy black media companies that have been around for 50 years plus, and they're incredible. You know, you have Essence, Ebony, Jet, um, and yet BET, a lot of them weren't covering news. They were entertainment brands um, or more culture and pop culture, which is fantastic. 
But the younger generation, my generation, and now even younger, we really care about the issues. We really care about what's happening in the conversations around culture and driving the culture forward. And there wasn't a brand or in the black space that was kind of evolving towards that and being of service for that in, in that platform for a dialogue. And so that was one of the, the second parts is, how is this possible that this doesn't exist? You know, you have that moment like, wait, I can't possibly be the only person who's thought of this, right? And as entrepreneurs, I mean, by nature, we are the people who think of things that other people haven't thought of, or we're the crazy ones who decide to actually do something about it, right? So I did have um, some moments of, okay, and then is it is it me? Am I the one to fix this problem? And yeah, why not me? Like, why not me? <laughs> right. And so, yeah, those are the, that was probably uh, within the first six to nine months of creating the business and, and starting to formalize, like, what's the name and introduce myself as, oh, I'm starting this business. And those are, that's when the, the identity starts to sink in that I'm really about to go and be an, a full time entrepreneur. Well, I'm, I'm six years behind you in this journey and I'm like soaking up every word here. I need all this positive energy. Um, I mean, in many ways, uh, we owe Blavity to the fact that after college, you headed out to Silicon Valley. As you said, you worked in corporate America, you worked at Intuit, you looked around you and you know you saw next to no one who looked like you. Um, I am a white woman who has never had that experience. I cannot even begin to imagine what that experience was like culturally. How much did that contribute to your decision to take the leap? Oh, it was a huge part of it. Um, being in a work environment where I was one of very few, um, where I could walk an entire day on campus of thousands of people and not see anyone that was Black um, at all, <laughs> it, it, it does uh, wear on you and it weared on me, you know, and, and I think part of it was I can predict the future. I can see myself still being at this company or at a big tech company in five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. And I felt like, I don't like this version of my life on a day-to-day -day basis. This isn't the legacy that I want to have. And so no better time than now to make a decision and redirect that vision of what my future could have looked like. Um, so it is, it is something that I think a lot of women of color and Black people in tech and in a variety of industries. I mean, not even just technology, in the medical field, um, in, in the media field, in journalism. It, it is something that we all have to work on. Yeah, amazing. Well, speaking of media, you left your job at Intuit right around the time that Michael Brown was killed by police in Ferguson. Um, and, and you've said that you noticed something that felt stunning to you, that were, there were just sort of so few Black uh, reporters covering this story, uh, no Black media. I think I heard you quoted that like that first, the first story by Black media, you didn't see until Monday and he was killed on a Friday or a Saturday or something like that. Um, it was all these white reporters sort of parachuting into this community and telling the story through their lens. Um, how big of a motivating factor were you well on the way to Blavity at that point, or was that a sort of a turning point for you? So Mike Brown happened in August of 2014. Um, I had launched a version of the product with my co-founders over the summer in July. So it was very back-to-back. -back. Um, when we started the business, it wasn't necessarily to uh, change the world, I'll be honest. I mean, it was definitely like, we're going to do a business and we're going to make content and community and platforms for Black people. We don't, we know who we want to serve. We're not positive on what the product's going to look like. We're not positive on um, which solution is going to be sticky. And I, I, unlike I think other entrepreneurs really um, try not to care too much about the solution. I care about the person and, and that gave me the flexibility to pivot whenever I needed to based off of the data that I was seeing. And so when Mike Brown happened, that was because I was so close to it being from St. Louis, but I was still in San Francisco, living in San Francisco, working at my day job. I could see and feel the, the gap. I could feel like this is not enough. Like this is not good enough. We need something else that can fill this gap, that can be a place of information, that can be of service to the people on the ground who are trying to get information out to everyone else on where do you donate? How do, who's in jail? How do we get them out? Like there was just so much happening so quickly in the black community. We didn't have a clearinghouse of truth that was from our perspective. And um, it, it just felt like something that I could make a difference with. 
Did you always think that Blavity would be a for-profit? Was there ever a moment where you toyed with the idea of launching a nonprofit, a C3? Um, Blavity absolutely needed to be for-profit. And so many reasons. I believe in economic advancement and closing the wealth gap is around entrepreneurship and ownership. And it has to be because we as a Black community, I think the fastest way is going to be the Black community lifting ourselves up. Um, you know, we can't, we're only going to convince so many people to care about us. <laughs> and uh, obviously it hasn't gone so well. So I think that for our community, we must be um, the ones who we are waiting for. We, we are the ones. And entrepreneurship it is the fastest way to wealth generation technology and being a participant in the tech industry. That's why I created AfroTech so that we weren't left behind on another huge wealth creation moment. We were in the game and we are still lots of work to do, but I do believe AfroTech has accelerated the Black folks that are in the technology industry. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's... Uh, so many things, so many reasons why Blavity Inc. needed to be for profit. And I will tell you, I haven't talked about this much, I actually just launched Blavity.org. So we are officially now starting the nonprofit. I'm so excited. I'm so proud of it. Um, and the first program launches um, this spring. Amazing. Well, I'm so glad that I asked that question then. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so I'd like to hear a little bit about what it was like to launch and raise funding for Blavity when you were first getting it off the ground in 2014. I mean, obviously, we know how little VC money goes toward women and in particular goes toward women of color. Um, I know you poured something like $250,000 of your own money into this over time. I heard a great story about how your dad told you to like keep working at the same time so that there was some money coming in. Yes. Um, and then only pitched uh, to Black VCs at the beginning. Um, talk about your efforts to get this stood up, the challenges there, what that was like. Yeah, um, I was a first-time founder. I am a first-time founder, right? And and as first-time founders, I, I as a first-time founder, I you don't know what you don't know, right? Like it was very much a learning, a, a steep learning curve for everything, everything, fundraising, the vocabulary, uh, the legal, the hiring, every single part of running a company I had to learn on my own for the most part. And a lot of it was through trial and error. And so when I was went out to fundraise, I did what I felt like was the obvious choice, which is I needed to convince somebody to give me money, right? That was That's the goal of fundraising. You're convincing people who have money to give it to you because you have a good business and you think you can return it with a certain return. Um, so first I needed to convince someone that there was a problem worth solving. And then two, I needed to convince them that there was a business here. And then three, that it could be big enough that I could give them their money back, right? And so I went with the first thing, which is, do people think there's a business here? Is there a problem that needs to be solved? So I just went to Black folks who were in venture capital and said, I know you know there's a problem to be solved. You must, <laughs> right? You're Black. I'm Black. This seems so obvious. Um, and they did agree there was maybe a problem to be solved, but they didn't necessarily agree it was a big business, nor did they necessarily have the economics um, on the fund side to be able to take the risk of us at that time. And so they all said no. Now, I didn't understand the dynamics between VCs and founders. I didn't understand necessarily the, the uh, returns that were required at, for certain fund sizes. And so in hindsight, I went after the wrong, um, but it was never going to work with that strategy. But in the moment, oh, man, I felt like I was run over by a truck. <laughs> you know, my own people said no. And that feeling will never leave me. And I, I am... Um, I hold on to that because I am now in a position with, with our brands, with our company, with publishing, being that first to publish. Like when someone pitches their story to our company, their small business that, you know, just got launched or they just had a huge milestone or the filmmaker who just poured all their last dollar into making this beautiful short for shadow and act. Like, I'm like, God, we have to say yes. Like, if not us, then who? Right. So it's been a motivating thing for me. And, and you know, going back to fundraising. So I, I, I was, you know, crying myself to sleep. And then I got back up and I said, OK, um, actually, my friends persuaded me. They said, like, Morgan, you really need to raise because we were getting big and it was expensive and I couldn't I couldn't afford it anymore. I needed to start paying my employees. And um, so I went out and raised from social impact investors because people who care, who understand the problem, 
who have different financial incentives, who are willing to take the risk because us existing pushes the culture forward and maybe we win and then, and they're happy, right? Um, and it's something that they can believe could work because that's part of why they started as investors in the first place is that they believe that people can build for-profit companies and do good and make a positive impact as with through through a business. So that was really uh, transformational for me in terms of just understanding the power dynamics in the venture capital industry, understanding all the parties involved, what everyone's solving for, and um, since that round, we were oversubscribed and, you know, people constantly are trying to give us money. I'm like, we are not raising. <laughs> and, um, and, and I feel grateful for that, but it, it is uh, that, that first six months on oh, man, no good. <laughs> well, as someone, I did this, just did this on the nonprofit side and I, uh, I can uh, counter, I, I know how terrifying that was in the early days for sure. So, I mean, when you got that first, I know that I think new media ventures is a big funder of you all and they're amazing. So that's incredible. Yeah. When the money started coming in, when you got the check, you know, it was obviously so clear that this was needed um, and it really took off, you know, at the same time you were and are operating in a media sphere and even a new media sphere that where black women are woefully underrepresented at the highest levels. Um, what has it been like for you making such a huge name for yourself in this arena? Do you feel like you have strong peers? Do you feel like there is still a dearth of, uh, of you know, strong black women at the helm of news organizations? Obviously, this is a moment in history where a lot of news organizations are talking about um, or grappling with their own racial reckonings long overdue. It's such a great question. For um, From a media perspective, there are not that many women on the business side of a black and black women, certainly <laughs> on the business side of of media and making these big decisions. Um, Blavity is still only six years old. So we are um, just very early in our media news journey in comparison to many of our peers who have been in the game for 40, 50, 60 plus years. Um, so I think that to me, I'm really focused on serving our audience through content and through brand. And now as the company has, has matured and built into profitability where we can have some more flexibility around how we're spending our cash. We're working on building our brands across multiple channels of distribution. And so what does it look like for us to be in audio? What does it look like for us to be in, in streaming and OTT? What does it look like for us to finally say yes to Snapchat to get that channel or TikTok, you know, where I was so reluctant before because I didn't want to risk um, the making a, a misstep. I was, I operated out of fear of, of making a mistake and then having to go bankrupt, <laughs> right? Because when you're a startup, you don't have much cushion. And I share that because I think, um, you know, for those entrepreneurs who are watching this, there is always this fear of, if I make a mistake, I don't have a safety net, right? And I think in, in the news world and for media, uh, it's a very expensive business because content, when you're doing it right, is expensive. And so I think we're just getting started in terms of really being able to cover the true, true stories of our community and be of service and work in partnership with some of the best storytellers of our generation. I think we're just getting started, really. I, I feel you wholeheartedly on the sort of not stepping outside your comfort zone too soon. Everything is expensive, I mean, particularly when you think about video and audio. It's like a, a whole right. other level. Um, you have now built many, many successful businesses. Uh, it's not just Blavity. Afrotech, Travel Noir, as we said, 2190, Emrose Essentials, Growth Notebook. Um, all of them are targeting different segments of Black America and beyond. Can you talk about uh, your decision to corner you know, a truly sort of identity-based market and, and why it has worked so well? Yeah, it's a question that I think is really important um, because early on people were like, well, why don't you make a Hispanic version of Blavity? Like if you've been successful over here, why don't you make it, you know, go to other demographics? And I'm like, we are not successful yet. <laughs> like we still have so much to do to cover the Black experience in this country and around the world. I mean, I could uh, very easily think about Blavity in the UK. Totally. Right. Like, moment. My God. Yeah. You know, Blavity in Europe, like there are black expats. There are people who have a diaspora experience. Um, Blavity in Brazil, a huge, huge Afro ex experience in, in Brazil. Blavity in Nigeria. Like, I don't need to go 
outside of the black experience because we are a huge population in this world and we are barely even scratching this the service when it comes to even america so it's it's something that um i think we as as, as americans have such a narrow perspective on the world and um and, and even we just think about our own little universe, even within the United States. And when you have a come from a global perspective or you consider the total audience of um, something that may appear to be niche, but actually is like really not. Uh, right. Um, now, I get it because I've, I've, I've done this conversation with investors where they say, well, there's X amount of 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 people in America, there's X percent of them are millennial and X percent of the millennials are black. And so your total market just out the gate is, you know, X, Y, Z. And I'm like, really, who do you listen to in music? What sports do you watch? Who are your favorite athletes? Like, no, black culture is also part of American culture. So from which, whichever way you look at it, black audience is actually a, a very, very, very smart choice. That's amazing. It's brilliant. I mean, honestly, I've had those conversations with investors about women and they're 51% of the American electorate. It's like, right? <laughs> this is not a niche. Right? It's not a niche. Yeah. I mean, it, it is in relation to the majority. I understand that, but the majority is shrinking. Exactly. Exactly. Every single day. So I want to pivot a little bit and talk about what the last year has been like for you professionally. I mean, you're, when you talk about those like sort of early days of, you know, being in tears, trying to figure out if you're going to be able to make this work, obviously this has been an exceedingly difficult year um, uh, for women, for women of color in particular. And I think, you know, obviously women entrepreneurs have struggled as well from the sort of national reckoning on race over the summer to the pandemic um, that has created big difficulties for advertising revenue. And I speak from personal experience in that regard. Uh, just, can you just talk about what the challenges have been like in the last year of your life? So many uh, learning opportunities for me and growth, growth moments. I'm certainly a way better leader than I ever been in my entire life. Um, I'll start with the, the personal first. I mean, I think for me, as someone who was always on the road, you know, doing public speaking engagements, um, meeting our audience, our community, traveling, doing happy hours, and you know, just making sure that I and the company are available and accessible. Um, it was a bit of a transition for me to be at home. Um, and I'm single, I don't have dog, like, so it was just like a lot of, I'm always around people and all around, and all of a sudden around no one <laughs> for, for weeks, for months. And so, um, it gave me some time to really think about who I wanted to be and who I, who I had become through momentum and, and all the pressures of what people had expected of me and how I responded to those pressures. Uh, as a black woman who is one of very few race venture funding, there's a lot of responsibility that I am grateful for, but take on in terms of being of service, um, and, and just that also on top of actually just trying to run a business that that wins is it was a lot of pressure. So I'm grateful for the time to focus on myself and to understand and figure out who I wanted to be and what I, how I was going to operate in the world. And even some healing, like even forgiving myself for mistakes that, that were inevitable along the way. And so that was really nice, you know, to have that solitude in my adult life. Um, now at the business level, Blavity has two core businesses. We are a we have Afrotech, which is a huge driver of profitability for the business. It's a it's a fantastic conference experience. It's you know a monopoly in its in, in its field, and we were we're in person, <laughs> right? So we had to quickly make a decision to cancel the conference and build a digital experience that still made people feel something and get back to that connectivity and ultimately accomplish its goal, which is to get people jobs or have people stay in tech and the jobs that they have or develop skills as they're learning and navigating their careers. So we built this whole avatar experience where you could go, you could sign in, you could dance, you could walk around and walk in and out of, of conference rooms. Um, we built a live streaming platform so that people could go if they didn't want to do the whole avatar hangout thing, they could just watch the content on, on their, their web browser. So we built a lot of things very quickly and kind of went into war zone to make sure that we could still be of service in a time in which people really wanted to connect. Um, 
that was tough because I was asking my team to also offer operate at 110% in the middle of the pandemic. And then also because of the social unrest on the media side of the business, uh, which is the second half, you know, our second division, my team was tired and covering death is a burden I don't think many people understand. Like the news team has been covering black death for six years. And so we lose people, not because they don't like working here or they don't want to be a black journalist because it's just like, it is exhausting to get DMs and emails from mothers and wives and sisters and friends who are saying so-and-so got shot and you're the only publication that could cover it. And we have to look into that stuff. We, we, we are supposed to, we are, that is our mission, right? And so I was very conscious of we're in a pandemic. We now have a responsibility. How do I lead through this? And, and our revenue paused. <laughs> like the, you know, we are a business. We are not a not-for-profit. So that was very, um, it tested me a lot. And so what, what I, what, how I managed it was uh, through our strong leaders. I mean, I have an incredible team of directors and VPs at our company who uh, really made a commitment to our, each other and to the company to get us through this. And we were in, we went into overdrive um, and we all aligned on the principles of decision-making on how we were going to make decisions so that everyone could operate uh, marching towards the same end goal. And some things that I did, I started meeting with our associate level every two weeks. I started meeting with our managers every two weeks. Um, we did a lot of town halls that were just healing. You know, people people sh shared poems, people shared songs. Um, there was one conference call that like, I just couldn't even speak. I was just crying the whole time. And my co-founders had to kick off the meeting because it's, it's just overwhelming to be in a group of people um, that care so much and, and also are responsible for so much. And we're mostly, we're mostly people of color, you know? Um, so yeah, last year was really tough. Last year was really tough for the business, but I'm proud that we uh, came out stronger than ever, uh, profitable and able to give a lot of money back to our employees. You know, we gave everybody vacations and self-care bonuses. And once we made it through, it was like, we did it, Joe. <laughs> like, we did it, you know? So take, I went to Costa Rica for 30 days. I was like, I'm on vacation. You know, it was very important to me that we walked into this year um, feeling like we made it, feeling like we made it and I had time to heal. I've had time to kind of pick up the pieces in my personal life or whatever that may be with myself and um, move forward with, with our goals, you know, move forward with the company. And so it's been an incredible quarter to date. Well, that's unbelievable. And I, I mean, all of us grappling with this moment in history that takes extraordinary leadership and the fact that you've been able to be there and be such a supportive and empathetic uh, lead for your team and also able to sort of pivot, you know, that's like the ultimate in entrepreneurship is to learn all this new technology learn how to stream all these things, like suddenly make the in-person experience virtual. That yeah. is exhausting. Um, I'm curious as we sort of begin to see the light with this pandemic, you know, with, uh, with the president saying things may be, you know, more or less back to normal by the 4th of July, you know, what do you miss from your previous life from the standpoint of your professional life? And are there lessons that you will take into the future? You know, are there ways that the business is forever changed? Is the, is there, are there ways that sort of work-life balance is forever changed? Mm -hmm. I think that um, I do miss conferences. I say that hesitantly because as someone who was always on the road speaking at conferences, it's a catch-22. <laughs> but what I love about being an entrepreneur and building a business is just the people you meet along the way. And so to not have that spontaneous connection, um, those high impact moments where you can meet 50 to 100 people, 500 people, was definitely tough. I, I think some of us have found that experience on Clubhouse. Um, some of us have found that experiences in, in smaller group gatherings on Zoom and, and that's been beautiful, but I don't think anything replaces uh, the in-person the in-person connections that can happen when you're just standing in line, you know? Um, so I look forward to that. And in terms of how the business has changed, 
I think we've learned we can do a lot less with more. I mean, a lot more with less. <laughs> um, exactly. I definitely think we can do a lot more with less. You know, we used to think we had to have 10 people in a production to pull it off. Oh, now we have three and two people joining remotely. Um, we have learned a lot about operating and communication. Our written communication at this company is incredible now. You know, you can't get away with just a, a quick email. No, it needs to be concise. You know, there's no casual conversations that are happening. Um, we're, we've made the decision to be fully remote. So we're not having the office anymore. Um, people have moved all over the world. I have, I have folks who are in different countries who are working and operating at the best they ever have. And so I look forward to also from a culture point of view, us learning how to be a strong community together virtually. So thinking about retreats, thinking about um, team building meetings where we fly people in to different cities, there's definitely some work that we're going to need to do to keep that connectivity um, and that, that team really strong. I'll, I do think it's going to be a much better experience, though, for people of color and for women, because we've, uh, through, my, th through my employees and even my own experience, I know how much more we take care of others. And having to go into an office and the physical like leaving of space and even this the commuting um is restrictive for some people and this has given a lot of folks i think the freedom to be able to handle how, their work how they want to handle their work you know yeah, Point. I mean, I was on the road like three days a week before the pandemic and I have a five-year-old and I have not been away from her for a single bedtime in more than a year. And it's just, I mean, when you think about what you can do and how much of that travel was unnecessary, I'm with you. Like I miss so much of the in-person, but there are also aspects of our lives uh, that I do think are, this is really good for equity um, in particular. Yeah. For, for yeah. And I think it's going to get better when people can have their kids go to daycare <laughs> and they're not doing two, three jobs <laughs> right at home. So it's like, it's, it's like there's, it was really painful to get to this level of freedom. Um, for many people, I have so many friends with kids and I'm just like, I don't know how you do it. Like, I, it's just incredible, incredible. Um, but now I'm like, yes, yeah, send, send them to school, okay? But you stay home and like, just imagine the new productivity that women are gonna be able to have. And men now that they know how much work it takes. <laughs> The point of that, that, I mean, that's definitely part of this equation too. So, all right, well, uh, we've, we're about to be out of time. So I've got one more question for you here. And that is that, you know, lots of companies talk the talk, but don't walk the walk when it comes to, to DEI, when it comes to DEI and belonging. What is the secret to building truly inclusive workplaces in your mind uh, to ensuring people don't just have the seat at the table, but, but feel like they are meant to be there? You know, I advise a lot of, um, a lot of CEOs of Fortune 100 companies through our work with Afrotech, we've been very, like gotten very close with leadership teams who genuinely are trying to do better and genuinely are struggling with it, even though they are doing their best. And I believe that. Um, and I've seen companies who are doing well, right? Like who, who made a decision and have been able to be successful. And I think the difference, to be honest with you, and this is not something that I think a lot of people want to challenge, but the ones that have done really well in actually making a difference, not just caring and talking about making a difference, is when the white man at the top makes it his priority. And it's just like, it's, it's annoying, <laughs> you know, but that's when I see the difference happens much faster because he says, we have 10 seats at the table, at the board level, at the VP level, at the SVP level, at the director level, whatever level is the high level. We have 10 seats. Now I can do one of two things. If, if we're going to have more diversity on this board, you have one or two things. Someone needs to get off the board to make room for someone else, which is typically means a white man needs to get off the board to make room for someone else, or we need to add more chairs to the, to the table. Those are your only two options. <laughs> it's just that simple. And so I think previously people felt like um, a, a lot of people were holding on to their power because they actually didn't even really consider that. Just add more chairs. And so they felt like, well, the only option is for me to retire and I'm not done yet. And I worked so hard to get here and I'm a man. And <laughs> right. So I think that um, more people should consider adding more chairs 
to the table and not viewing uh, the, even if you are going to give up a seat, not viewing that as a, as a sign of defeat or that people are taking your spot or anything that like secession planning is a sign of strength. Building a diverse team that lives beyond you is a sign of strength and sign of true leadership. And if we can reframe the conversation of really work with our white male, white men, <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's going to be something that I, that I will accelerate the conversation faster in the existing institutions. Now, the other thing that's happening is that the existing institutions are being disrupted. So the other way to do it is to say, we don't care about your table. Like, I'm not even going to try to fight the fight with you. You're all going to retire soon. Like, go away. You know, I, my business is going to crush your business, right? Our company is going to crush your company and our company is going to start off diverse. Our company is going to start off doing it right. So I'm really encouraged by the newer companies that are IPOing, the Bumbles, the Peloton. Like there are companies that are, are new, that are disrupting, and they're going to be our generation's Fortune 100. And so let's focus on those CEOs. Like, let's focus on those companies. So I love working with those companies because there's, there, let's just not have the problem. Let's just build it into your business, right? Amazing. Morgan, you're fantastic. Um, thank you so much for setting the bar so high. And thank you so much for joining us uh, at, for this program. It's really been fantastic to be with you. Thank you, Emily.